before I say anything about uh, Dr. Lou Gross, today's speaker, I suggest to you to go to his website because it's impossible to explain what he has done uh, here. So, but again, I, I have to say anything anyway. So actually, uh, today's speaker, we are really, really, really pleased to actually have Dr. Lou Gross here. It's James R. Crox and Elvin and Sally Beeman, distinguished professor of ecology and evolution and biology and mathematics at the University of Tennessee in Oxville, and he's director of the Institute for Environmental Modeling, and now he's, uh, and he's also director of the NIMBIOS, National Institute of Mathematics and Biological Synthesis until 2015, now he has been director emeritus, and past president of the Society of Mathematical Biology, or Society and past president of the University of Tennessee in Oxville Faculty Senate. Uh, he did an education, but he did his PhD from Cornell in 1979. Then he has written, I think, at least seven books. I should say at least everything he does. It hasn't been updated. At least seven books, more than 80 uh, publications, and many book chapters, and a lot of, a lot of things. And he's actually one of the leading figures of the mathematical biology, mathematical ecology in the world. So let's welcome our speaker. And, and don't believe everything he tells you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to come here. Um, I, uh, I really am enthralled by this new program that you're developing that involves collaborations between mathematicians and people in a wide variety of other disciplines and involving undergraduates in research projects. I think it's wonderful. What my job is today is to talk to you a little bit about uh, ideas of mathematics related to what we will call optimization uh, or maximization. Uh, and that's what I mean by best. And so I'm going to provide you with a bit of a variety of biological ideas associated with what we might mean by what is the best thing to do. Um, and uh, this is uh, also sort of a result from this institute. And I, I will encourage you to go to the website for uh, NIMBIOS. Uh, we locally call it NIMBIOS. But um, the idea of this is to encourage people to collaborate um, and to foster connections between particularly the biological sciences and the mathematical sciences. We have a wide variety of activities for people of all levels of experience from uh, undergraduates to graduate students. And I encourage you to go to the website, uh, nimbios.org. Uh, one of the things that we do, this is a network graph of the collaborations that have arisen between people in different disciplines from just one set of the activities here. These are working group activities. And I point this, I, I put this up because, number one, there is this entire new field of what's called network science, and applying ideas of mathematics, particularly graph theory, to looking at, in this case, connections between people's main disciplinary area. Um, in this case, the, uh, the uh, size of the circles there represent people who have that as their primary discipline who've been involved in these working group activities we have. But it's non-linearly scaled. So it's scaled not by uh, the radius, but by this, the log of radius. Otherwise, biology would be much bigger and mathematics would be much bigger uh, in there. But the point is, as well, that we have connection to many, many other disciplines. And this is the way of modern science. It does involve lots of connections between people in different backgrounds. And we knew this when we sort of developed this institute, which is funded by the National Science Foundation through the biological uh, division. <clears throat> but there were, certain, so there were certain things that I knew was going to happen from this. One of them were, was these connections between disciplines. But there were certain things that I didn't know were, were going to happen that were sort of surprises. So this is one of the many papers that have been produced from this. It's in a journal called Evolution. Evolution is one of the primary journals in the world in evolutionary biology. The authors are Dalton Chaffin, Hayes Griffin, and Tucker Gilman. So here's a picture of the authors. Uh, and so these two were students, and they spent their entire senior year working on this paper. The paper includes two different kinds of mathematical models, one an agent-based model, one a, a more classic dynamical system model, to try to understand why imprinting. Imprinting means that a particular offspring 
chooses an adult, typically a parent, but it doesn't have to be a parent, to sort of follow around uh, in, in some sense, uh, behavioral. Um, and so I never expected that a paper like this in the premier journal in the world in this area would, would get developed by two students, particularly because those two students were seniors in high school when they did this. So uh, totally unexpected. Uh, what this means is that there are many, many challenging areas of biology in which you can contribute even if you may not have a tremendous amount of scientific um, background already. Okay? Um, but it does, I mean, they work really hard. So. so my job today is to say something about models of biology in general, uh, then talk about optimization to find what that is in a minute. And then I'm going to go on in my area, which is natural resource uh, and sort of ecological areas, and say something about what we call control, how to manage systems. And I probably won't have time to say a lot about each of these, but I'll say something about raccoon rabies and and uh, uh, wildfire, and then I'll end up with some lessons, and if I have time, I'll say something about cellular autonomy. So this is my favorite quote about what science is, and I'll read it. Science is thought to be a process of pure reductionism, taking the meaning out of mystery, explaining everything away, concentrating all our attention on measuring things and counting them up. It is not like this at all. The scientific method is guesswork the making up of stories. The difference between this and other imaginative works of the human mind is that science is then obliged to find out whether the guesses are correct, the story's true. Curiosity drives the enterprise and the open acknowledgement of ignorance. So this is my favorite one paragraph description of how science works. It comes from a little bit of an unusual place. Uh, it was written by Lewis Thomas. Lewis Thomas a classic, uh, wonderful uh, scientist who was the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine for a long time, and wrote essays in it regularly. Uh, but this, this quote was from the Sierra Club Bulletin. I've never found anything quite like it anywhere else. Uh, here's a picture of Lewis Thomas. And, and this, this quote has a couple of things in it that really are the essence of some of the topics today. One is science is about the making of the stories. So the stories that we make up in, in science are theories, and the components of those theories are models. How we describe the work uh, that we do is models. Uh, but it's not just models. It's then observation. It's checking out whether or not those models are indeed consistent with how we observe the world. So it also requires data. And uh, <laughs> the, the sort of stories and, and models are obviously not consistent with everything about how the world works, but consistent with only part of it. So the stories that we tell in science, the models that we use, are chosen to selectively include some parts of the world and selectively ignore other parts. So the process of modeling I call the process of selective ignorance. You decide what to include and what to ignore. Now this, you should, uh, you recognize this? <laughs> Yeah. Right, okay. So, on that map, okay, it includes certain things, right? It, probably, it has this building, it has other buildings, it has uh, a little bit about the roads connecting them. What's missing? What's not on this? Okay, there's other buildings, that, so it's not consistent with the building. What else? Sidewalks. Sidewalks? Yeah. Where we are, like, which point we are, which point? Oh, where, which point? So where the humans are around on this. That's right. There's no humans, right? There's no cars. What else? No, yeah, there's no trees. There's, yeah. So there's lots of things that are missing from this. So if you wanted to know how to walk from one building to another, assuming the buildings were actually on there, uh, then you know if it would be useful to you as a model. But if you were looking at the sewer system connecting the buildings, this is not very helpful because it doesn't tell us where the sewer lines are or where the internet uh, connection lines are, where the fiber optic lines are, right? So there are certain things that models are good for um, and certain things that they're not. Now, models in biology, when you talk to a biologist and you say, I'm, I'm using this model, they would typically mean this, okay? Model organisms. So the mouse and the rat and the ferret and the E. coli and so on are 
organisms chosen because they have certain kinds of characteristics that may be appropriate to analyze the particular questions of interest to you, whether they're physiological questions, if you're talking about humans, or whether they're drug uptake ones, or if you're talking about ecological systems or uh, microcosms that in some sense are designed to mimic the kinds of behaviors that occur in the natural world. Um, and there's no really um, clear idea how to choose one thing over another. That's a whole area of uh, sort of expertise. As a mathematician, though, this is another kind of model, right? This is a model that includes certain things, in this case, about connections between uh, individuals which are, which are susceptible uh, to a particular disease or infected by the disease or so-called removed, which means that they're not capable of being infected, infected anymore. And we'll, we'll talk about things like this a little bit more. But the point is that this is also a model. It's different in structure. It's not a real model in the sense that these animals are real. This is real only in the figment of your imagination which thinks about how the world works is mathematical. Now, there's always a question about what might be the best model. Okay? So there's really generally little guidance about how you decide what best is, except in certain areas. So there's a whole field of model selection and statistics. Uh, but with regard to analog models, those organisms, it's not really clear how, why you would choose a mouse for this kind of study versus a rat versus a ferret. And, and so there's arguments about that. And that ties in very much to many medical issues about how you decide what's an appropriate therapy. Um, in, in many respects, the choice of models is kind of ad hoc. Now, there's lots of different reasons to build a model. I'm not going to go through all this. I don't expect you to read it. The point is that some models are used to describe data. Some models are used to make predictions. Some models are used to be, be able to compare and contrast two different uh, sort of ways of managing a system. Um, and one of my favorite is number 10 up here. It provides an antidote to the helpless feeling that the world is too complex to understand in any generality. And it provides a mean to get it at general patterns and trends. Okay? So there's lots of different reasons to cons uh, construct models. And there's no one model that is everything. So this is uh, chosen from my graphic form of of a, a concept from Richard Levins, that there are trade-offs. Models can be very general, they could be very precise, and they could be very realistic. And those, those terms, let's not worry about a realistic model is one that you can imagine getting data and actually using the data to parameterize the model. Um, a general model is one that much of the sort of mathematical theory in biology has been developed. They're not designed to be highly realistic or focused in on a particular system. And much uh, precise models are often statistical models in which they're fit to a particular data set. The point is that no one model can do everything. And when you sit down to do this, and I know I, I, some of you are in um, modeling class right now, right? Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> they're not going to say yes, but okay. <laughs> they're going to volunteer. <laughs> but, but you know, you should think before you sit down to construct the model, where you want it to sit in this space. What are your objectives in terms of what kind of model you want? Now, I claim that you make models all the time, right? So, here you go. What decision do you make when you're faced with a follow? Come into a, a supermarket, you've got to check out and write it. What do you, how do you decide what to do? Come on, come, give me some ideas. Do I really need to go to the supermarket? That's it, right? <laughs> you want to just turn around and walk out. What else? Shortest line, what else? What do I need to buy? Oh, pardon me? What do I need to buy? Well, okay, thinking about what you need to buy and whether you should go somewhere else or, yeah. Okay, what else? Oh, okay, so now you're thinking sort of mental level. I'm thinking about you're there and you've got to go into one of these lines. That may not help you if you've got to go into one of these lines, but okay. <laughs> what else? Yeah. How much stuff is inside each person's cars? Oh, that's right. You might look ahead and say, oh, there's a, yeah, I don't, do you call them buggies here? Uh, no, what do you call them, shopping carts? <laughs> uh, in the South, we call them buggies. Okay. So, so and you might look and see how much is in each other and, and, and decide where to go. What else? Can I go to the express lane? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Go to the express lane. Um, anything else? Yeah. 
Self-checkout. Self-checkout. You could do that too. Right. So you're making a decision about what line to go in. You have built a model in your mind making a decision about what to do based upon all those sorts of things. Now, I didn't hear many, many people and, and audiences that are like your age relative to my age also say that they take into account the, how cute the checker is. <laughs> but, so, that, so in other words, there's, there's lots of different decisions. And the best model for you may not be the best model for someone else. Okay. Um, but you do this all the time. Now, in, in science, the, the process of modeling is typically <coughs> kind of circular. And I'm going to illustrate this here with environmental modeling, in which there's some sort of data. Uh, in this case, this is the Everglades in the center of South Florida, but you have some kind of data. In this case, it might be a geographic information system uh, set of information about vegetation, about uh, species, densities, and other things. Um, and then the kinds of models that you apply if this were mathematical, could be a differential equations or matrix models. If it were more computational, it might be what we call an agent-based model, in which you track lots of different agents or organisms or individuals moving around. Or it could be a statistical model. Or once you've done that, you sort of decided on a model form, then you want to use uh, some kind of simulation to do it. And that could be simulation using a language, if you're lucky, you can actually analytically write down the solution, but often that's not that easy to do. Um, and, and then there's this whole process of evaluating whether or not what you've done is reasonable for the objectives for which you developed. And that involves issues like visualizing the results, uh, looking at corroboration, meaning uh, is there an independent data set that shows that this is similar, and look at sensitivity and uncertainty of the, of the results. That then provides potentially input to how you would control or manage the system. Uh, in the case of South Florida, this would be water regulation and, and maybe harvesting in some places. And then you take additional data. And the process starts all over again, because now you've got additional data, and you may then go back through this system and modify. So the process of modeling is often iterative like this. Uh, whether it's dealing with environmental stuff, whether it's dealing with a business process, whether it's dealing with management in a hospital, all of those things involve processes that are often iterative. And the, the hard part is trying to decide how to stop. So I'm going to use one example that presumably you're all kind of familiar with. Um, drug dosage, right? Um, I bet everyone here has been involved at some point in taking some kind of medication. Um, and so the field of pharmacokinetics <coughs> is the study of the uptake, metabolism, and the way that drugs are eliminated from the body. Um, and the mathematics from, for this starts out very simple with just exponential decay because the presumption is that when you take a drug that it is removed from your body, either because it's metabolized or because you're pissing it out, one way or another. And, uh, and, and so the way that you describe this is with typically a system of differential equations which describe how much of the drug is in this part of the body versus this part of the body, or in a simple case, just the whole one. Um, and that's all, basically the whole field of pharmacokinetics is, 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 is that. Now, there's a new field. I just want to point out that the science does, does change. So pharmacogenomics is this connection between the response of an individual to a particular compound, the drug, and their genetic makeup. And you've probably all heard of this field of so-called personalized medicine, in which what you do in terms of what kinds of treatments are, are given for a particular set of syndromes or disease um, depends upon your individual genetic makeup. That's this field. And so it's a really, it's a current active area of research. Uh, I can't claim that everyone knows how to do this at all. Um, and there clearly are individual genetics and physiological states that impact whether or not a disease is, uh, is treatable. So I'll give you a simple example that was worked on uh, by uh, one of our former postdocs, in which he looked at acetaminophen. So as acetaminophen is a main compound in Tylenol. And somewhere around 5 to 7% of the population in the U.S. 
does not metabolize acetaminophen, meaning that it builds up and it can be toxic. Uh, and you know, this is an over-the-counter drug, and you don't see that when you, uh, but but it's actually a fact. One of the largest uh, groups of people who come into uh, hospitals with uh, drug toxicity are due to acetaminophen. Taken, oh, this didn't work. I'll take another one. I'll take another one. Uh, and that's because genetically they're not able to uh, <coughs> absorb. So what's the basic way that we think about models for how drugs are eliminated from the body? Well, the basic model is just exponential decay. So that's that. Hopefully you've all seen this thing. The E, remember, is like 2.7, it's just a number. And with the minus KT, that says as time goes on, that term gets smaller and smaller. All right? Everybody remember that, hopefully? Um, the V is the dose. It's how much the dose. If you give a certain dose, imagine giving a, taking a, <coughs> an injection of a particular drug, and then it decays away, it reduces itself. Uh, and so if we let A be E to the minus K tau, tau is the time between doses. Right? So the A basically measures how much <coughs> the drug has decayed away in a time period tau. Reasonable? Then, if Xn is how much is in your body after the nth dose, this is how much is in your body after the n plus first dose. It's how much you have left over from the previous dose after another time period. So the A says this is a fraction that um, is, is remaining from the previous dose, uh, plus the new amount added because you've taken another dose. Uh, and you can actually then go ahead and uh, if you've taken a little modeling course, you've seen how to solve this, you can get an e equation for this. The point of doing this is the fact that you, you, know, you actually have a couple of things that you can control here. You can control the magnitude of the dose, and you can control how long a time it is between doses. Right? There are two different things that you can control to affect what goes on. Here's a picture dynamically of what's going on. If you start out with some initial level of the drug, X0 up there, and let it uh, and then wait a time period, in this case the tau is one time period, so that's first dose, second dose, and so on, then what happens? Well, eventually the drug builds up and it reaches an equilibrium. Why does it reach an equilibrium? Meaning that the peak there is the same in between doses. What's happening? Anybody want to guess? Why does it reach this thing where it goes up to the same level? And then drops off. And you're given this fixed dose B amount every every one time in this picture. What's going on? Tolerance? Well, actually that's a that's an interesting idea. Tolerance yeah, usually refers to how an individual's um, symptoms respond to a drug. And in this case, we're not measuring symptoms, we're just measuring how much of the drug is in the body. But it's a good that's a good point. We haven't talked. Tolerance is another whole issue. <laughs> so, so what are we getting with the absorbed beyond this point? Now the body cannot absorb beyond this point. That's, that's another interesting way to think about this. Uh, is there a limit to how much the body can absorb? Mm, not, not really. I, don't, I didn't build that into the model. Um, but what I did build into the model is that the body is losing a certain amount of the drug at, at a certain rate. And so what's going on here is that eventually, after a certain number of doses, the amount of the dose that decays away is exactly the same as the amount that you're taking every one time. Later. Does that make sense? So you're pissing it out or whatever, and the amount that you lose from the body in one time unit is exactly the same as the amount of that dose. So this is what we call equilibrium in biology. Okay? Uh, mathematics too. Same thing. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so that's pictorial, and, and by the way, it's very easy to see, you know, if the drug is only effective at some level, then you don't want this kind of a thing to go on. What you want to do is to give the dose of the drug so that it's up near that upper part, right? the part that's here like between 6 and 7 and 8. So what do you do to have that happen? Anybody, anybody had a pharmacology course or anything? Or you ever heard of the term bolus or loading dose? Loading dose. What you do 
is instead of giving that initial level B, B is the amount of the drug, you give a larger amount so that you get up there to the peak. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Just for the first time. And then you're at equilibrium right away. This is just a little bit of mathematics that shows you how you can think about something that's very common, in this case, drug dosage uh, stuff. Okay? So, um, and, and, the, and the point here is that there's no necessarily single best treatment because you can control the amount of the dose and you can control the time between. So what is typically done? You choose the times to be convenient for the patient, right? So you don't have to get up in the middle of the night every two hours, right, to take a drug because that's really inconvenient, right? So, um, so you actually can choose the time between the dosages based upon the uh, amount of the dosage, or you can do the reverse. And, and mathematically,